Living Corporate is brought to you by The Access Point. The reality is, this is the largest influx of black and brown talent corporate America has ever had. And as a result, a variety of talent entering the workforce are first generation professionals. The other reality, most of these folks aren't learning what it means to navigate a majority white workplace in their college classes. Enter The Access Point a live weekly web show within the Living Corporate Network that gives black and brown college students the real talk they need and likely haven't heard elsewhere. Every week, our hosts and special guests are dropping gems, so don't miss out. Check out The Access Point, airing every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Central Standard on livingcorporate.tv. Hey everybody, this is See It To Be It, the weekly podcast from Living Corporate. Living Corporate is a digital media network that centers and amplifies black and brown people at work. My name is Amy C. Wanninger, and I'm the host of See It To Be It. When I was young, growing up in rural southern Indiana, I didn't know people who went to college or who worked in professional roles. I didn't know what those jobs looked like, much less how to break into them. But this show isn't about me, it's about my guests. Every week, I bring you career stories from everyday role models in jobs you may not know exist. More importantly, the folks I interview share their perspectives as black and brown professionals in jobs and environments where they may be the only. My guest today is Angel Henry. She is a fellow Hoosier, so she lives in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana area, And she is a friend of mine. She's somebody that I've worked with in the past on some other projects, and she works in the information technology space. But before we get to the interview, we're going to tap in with Tristan for some career advice. What's going on, Living Corporate? It's Tristan, and I want to thank you for tapping back in with me as I provide some tips and advice for professionals. This week, let's talk about burnout, what it is, and how to recognize it. Before we can recognize burnout, we have to understand what it is. In May of 2019, the World Health Organization announced the 11th version of the International Statistical Classification of Diseases and Related Health Problems, also known as the ICD-11. This revision included an updated and more detailed entry on burnout. While it was previously only classified as a state of vital exhaustion, it's now classified as a syndrome conceptualized as a result from chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. The World Health Organization emphasizes that burnout is specifically work-related and characterized by three main things. One, a sense of exhaustion or depletion. Two, mental distance from or negativity or cynicism about work. And three, decreased effectiveness at work. Now that we know what burnout is, let's talk about all the signs of burnout. First, you don't get excited about work anymore. If you feel like you're no longer interested in the work that you're doing, even the things that used to make you feel fulfilled, you may be experiencing burnout. This sometimes may even be depression, and if you think that is the case, I suggest you speak with a mental health professional. The second sign is that you're no longer putting in the effort. When you lose that excitement and enthusiasm, you might get negative or even apathetic. Then you begin doing just the minimum to get by, rather than your normal amount of effort in the workplace. The third sign is that your performance begins to suffer. I don't think this is a surprise to anyone, but since you are less interested in your work and begin doing the bare minimum, your performance begins to decline. The fourth sign is that you feel exhausted or depleted. Often you'll feel mentally, physically, and emotionally drained. It may be challenging to get out of bed and to get to work. The fifth sign is that your burnout manifests physically into ailments and bodily issues. This looks different for everyone, but some of the most common ones include insomnia, chest pain, headaches, shortness of breath, dizziness or fainting, stomach issues, or you could just be getting sick more often. Generally, burnout can be difficult for most of us to recognize, but it's necessary that we recognize the signs because it isn't something that will just go away. Next time, we'll talk about what to do if you think you're burnt out. Thanks for tapping in with me this week. This tip was brought to you by Tristan of Layfield Resume Consulting. Check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Layfield Resume, or connect with me, Tristan Layfield, on LinkedIn. 
Living Corporate is brought to you by the Leadership Range, a podcast within the Living Corporate Network, hosted by globally certified and Fortune 500 executive coach and leadership development expert Neil Edwards. The Leadership Range is focused on having real, raw, soulful and accountable conversations about inclusive leadership, allyship, professional development. Every week is a new episode with new learning and new actions to take on to grow inclusively. Make sure you check out the Leadership Range everywhere you listen to podcasts. Welcome back to See It To Be It. My guest today is Angel Henry. Angel has a passion for diversity in tech. Her knowledge of why women and minorities are oftentimes missing from the C-suite provides awareness for technology leaders to drive change. Her first book, Dents in the Ceiling, is a summary of the experiences of 30 African-American women working in tech, and it is coming out in just a few days on June 8th, 2021. Angel, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I am so excited to have this conversation with you because every time we talk, um, I learn something, I have a great time, and um, I feel like I'm just a little bit closer to reaching my own goals because I'm so inspired by you and and what you accomplished. Thank you. Of course. It's not easy to be a woman in tech, mm-hmm. um, and it's much, much more difficult when you add the intersectionality of race onto that equation. Can you tell our audience a little bit about how you got started in technology and kind of what that career path has looked like for you? Absolutely. Um, well, it was uh, it was a no brainer. So I knew I wanted to work in computers, and I thought I was going to go into computer science. And how I got that thought was I was in high school, and I somehow I guess I scored well enough on the pre SATs. Uh, this is I think this is like my junior year of high school. And those that were minority had high GPAs and, um, again, scored some magical score on your pre-SATs. All those factors combined um, got you on the list for um, the counselor or, or the, um, the guidance counselor to submit your name to En-ROADS. And En-ROADS is um, an organization targeting minorities and females that are going into business, finance, or technology. And I remember they ushered us all into a room. It was probably maybe 20 to 30 of us from that high school. It was a very large high school in Cincinnati, Ohio. And we all got ushered into a classroom and they did, En-ROADS came and did a presentation. And they said two words, paid internship. <laughs> and I was hooked. Whatever I had to do, I was going to do it because I was going to get get paid that summer. And um, the cool part about it is they trained us. So I went through what I would call corporate boot camp. So you know, you picture it. It's high school, right? I'm 16, 17 years old. My peers are having fun at the mall and going out and hanging out and sleeping in. I'm up at 8 a.m. every Saturday morning, traipsing down to the University of Cincinnati to learn how to dress, how to talk, how to write a resume, how to do an interview. If you do land this this job in corporate America, here's what you can expect. And so it, it was literally corporate boot camp for minority students. It was, how do you talk the language? I mean, they even, they even gave us golfing lessons. (laughs) <laughs> and, um, and it, honestly, it helped, right? So I landed that first internship um, at a paper making company in Northern Cincinnati in their IT department. And I did three summers with them that propelled me into working at um, Deloitte Consulting for a summer. And then I landed my first internship at Eli Lilly and Company here in Indianapolis. And I loved it. So I, 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 I started corporate with already four full summers under my belt of working in IT and various organizations. So I got to tell you, as you're talking about inroads, and here I am, 40 years old, and I'm thinking, I want to go to that class because (laughs) (laughs) nobody pulled me aside in high school and told me anything except, you know, go to college. And it was, I mean, it was years before I understood even half of what you're talking about learning on Saturdays at 16. 
and I still don't know how to play golf, which I yes. still feel like yes. I, I still I there's like heart. <laughs> there's this little hole in my soul that I'm pretty sure you know, is because I never learned to play golf. It's like, if you never went to prom or you never learned to play golf, I'm like, I'm hoping it's not too late for me, no. but um, yeah, I can drive the golf cart unless yes. I had a beer and then forget it. <laughs> but, but you know, that's so valuable. And I think you're the second guest I've had on the show that works in tech that talked about getting their start with inroads. Mm. Um, so we'll make sure and link to that in the show notes, if I can remember. Um, but so tell me, you know, how many Saturdays was that out of your life? Oh. How many, how many, how many hangouts at the mall did you miss? Oh, tons, but, but worth, worth every moment, right? I wouldn't trade yeah. it for anything, but I do remember my mom and she always teases me about this, right? Like you said, 40 something years old and she still teases me about this. I was ready to drop out. I was like, I'm done I'm tired of getting up early on Saturday mornings. This is no fun anymore. Now keep in mind, I'm making, you know, and this is what, late 90s, I'm making $13.50 an hour, oh my which gosh. is huge, right? Compared to, you know, we're, again, working at the mall or- But it's or, not fun. And I can't yeah, get my orange Julius with my friends. Exactly. And she looked me dead in the eye and said, young lady, <laughs> I did not sacrifice all this time and energy for you to quit now. You will see this through. You made a commitment and you will, you will honor that commitment. And so I, you know, got, got up late, right? Put on my, put on my power suit and, um, and then, and hopped in the car and, you know, drove down to the campus to, to come to class. And uh, in hindsight, I'm, I'm so glad she did that. I'm so glad I, I, I completed that and, um, and have made connections and friends and opportunities through that to this very day. That's fantastic that not only did it set you up with the right skills, but also with the, the seedlings of a network. Exactly. Right? Yes. That's huge. That's Which huge. So important. Now in tech, there are all sorts of different roles, right? Everything from, you know, developer, tester, you know, analyst, scrum master, project lead. So talk to me about kind of the roles that you've held in your career, because I know that that's been, that's been a journey as well. It has. Yeah. I, um, I, I, like I said, I started off thinking that I was going to major in computer science at the university of Pittsburgh. And I took that first computer science class and said, Oh no, not for me can't do this. So I considered business or, or something else. And again, back to the inroad story, I remembered a gentleman had come in and said that his major was MIS, uh, Management Information Systems. And he explained that it was a, a, a melding of computer science and business. And so he took, you know, some finance, some marketing, some, some business courses, but also took some basic programming courses um, and I won't even say the the types of coding languages that we were talking about back then because it'll date me. But they don't exist anymore. It's they okay. don't exist anymore anyway, <laughs> right? Um, and so I, I remembered that when I was going to the counselor, dropping out of the CS program, and um, and said, you know, hey, is there any openings in the in the information science program? And and they said yes, and they handed me the 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 list of requirements that you have to to use to graduate with your um, information science degree from Pitt. And that was my template, you know, that that became um, my my marching orders for the classes that I would take. And the information science program at the University of Pittsburgh was and and still is wonderful. Um, Again, large group of network, it was very diverse. Um, The teachers, I'll I'll never forget, um, Dr. Flynn, uh, she passed away, but she was the first female role model that I had, right? So you can imagine um, all, I think all of my core um, science classes were taught by men, but yet here you have Dr. Um, Ida Flynn, who was the, the dean of the school, right? Um, very, very regal woman who was a, a champion for, for, for women in the program. And so if you were struggling, needed a tutor, extra assistance, if you even thought about dropping the program, you had to come see her first 
and she would make sure that you stayed. And she did That's that. That's awesome. Yeah. And you know, yeah. I was, as you were saying that, I was thinking about, I have a computer science degree, as you know, and I was trying to remember, did I have any mm-hmm. women right. as professors? Exactly. I, I remember one woman that was a TA, mm-hmm. a, a teaching assistant. Mm-hmm. grad student. I don't know. I would have to go back through my transcripts. I mm-hmm. don't know that I had a single woman professor in the computer science department. Exactly. Uh, or, or when I got a math minor, I don't know that I had any, any yeah. women okay. uh, who were math professors either. Mm-hmm. Now that I'm thinking about it. Now, right. my first degree was a little different. It was criminal justice and sociology and African-American studies and, and, okay. you know, a yeah. lot of like the, you know, the social sciences kinds of stuff. Um, and I had a lot of women professors there, but, and I remember even in getting my second degree in computer science, I remember a professor starting the class by saying, you know, who here has taken such and such, which was not an official prerequisite for the course. Okay. I was one of three women in the class. Um, and I was one, uh, and I was the only person who didn't raise my hand for this like non-official oh, geez. prereq. <laughs> You're already right. starting off on day one, like what I miss. <laughs> yeah. And he looked at me and he said, you shouldn't even be here. And this was like my second semester or third semester in the computer science department. Yeah. And I remember just like, like just fighting back those hot tears, right. Yeah. Of like, yeah you know, of just like being angry and embarrassed and humiliated. Absolutely. And um, the, one of the, I think one of the two other women in the class, <laughs> I was, I was getting ready to like complain about, <laughs> you know, this experience right. later. And yeah. it turned out one of the other women in the class was his daughter. So I'm really glad I didn't see it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but okay. um but yeah so you know I was one of two women in the class who were not related to the professor but but Gosh. I remember just being told like you don't belong here and and I know he was speaking specifically to the prereq right yeah. but when you yeah. look around the room right. and nobody yeah. looks like you and you're already wondering do I belong here that's like the worst thing you can hear exactly so, exactly well, well, that's, that you had. that's why I dropped the CS degree at least yeah. in information science it was a bit more quite a bit more diverse actually with a lot of female students that we yeah. and again I still have friends from um, my friend Nikki uh, in Texas we're still still connected to this day from that program we really supported each other through undergrad oh, but gosh. the the computer science classes that I took I, I, I minored in it I only had to take five or six classes I was the only African-American female in four of those five classes that I took. And so even though the professor didn't give me the, the verbal, you don't belong here, I, I felt it from the peers because they would join little study groups and I was never a part of the study group. And so I had to get my tutoring externally, right? Mm-hmm. Through through either the, the you know, the, the community at the college, the system where they, you know, you go up and you take a tab and you get a tutor. Um, or, um, you know, just, just friends who, again, maybe were math majors or yeah. um, the engineering majors. That network, you're right, really helped. I remember I joined um, NSBE, the National Society for Black Engineers, when they mm. expanded it past just engineering gr- degrees, but into CS and IS degrees. And I, I joined there, and that's where I got a lot of my tutoring. It was African-American men um, who were in the engineering, the various engineering disciplines that would help me with my calculus or my programming homework, because I was literally ostracized from the study groups that were in my CS classes. So I want to touch on what you just said, though, because this is something I didn't know when I was in college. If you're in college and you're listening to this, I want you to hear what Angel just said. You can go get help. The goal is not to get through the whole semester without asking a question. The goal is not to show how much, uh, you know, how resolute you are in your, you know, in your individualism. (laughs) I didn't know I could go ask for help. Oh, yeah. And I remember just sitting there with like literally with that Calc 2 book. Oh. Trying to figure out how to, you know, how to do the proofs and, you know, working through like, you know. (laughs) 
<laughs> I can't, and I remember, I, yeah. um, I would cringe trying to do that on my own. No, <laughs> but I mean, but I did, I mean, I didn't, I didn't know I could go find people that would help me. Yeah. Right. And I didn't, I couldn't, I had a hard time connecting with the instructors because they were, yeah. you know, they, they just, they didn't. And I don't know, even if I had connected with them, if I would have asked for help, um, because asking for help is not what I do best, but, um, yeah, please, if you're, if you're struggling, go ask for help, yes. <laughs> whether you're yeah. in college or anywhere else in your career, there are so many people out there who would love to be asked to help you. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, I'm sorry. I think I got us off topic, but oh, getting no, back to, yeah, so, so, so I, MIS so, degree, you yes, come out of college. Okay. What's I that knew job? I was not a coder. I knew I wasn't a coder. And luckily I had had enough internships to, to whittle down what I wanted to do. Right. So I had, I had played around with different applications and um, a little bit of business analyst work. And that's what I gravitated to. Uh, so I joined, uh, I remember um, Lily was, was kind enough to ask the interns what, you know, out of, out of the summer that you had, and they, we, we did a road show, right? You could go to the different departments, and they would showcase what they do and what um, skills or talents they need, and if, you know, try to match you up as best they could. And I remember telling my supervisor, Dave, at the time, I said, Dave, whatever you do, don't give me a coding assignment. I will do anything. Just don't give me a coding assignment. And he said, OK. <laughs> so um, I joined as a, a learning management administrator. So I was I was basically testing and checking in other people's code <laughs> and um, and and learning the system and doing different different changes. And that first job was actually my favorite because I got um, the opportunity very quickly to go to Mexico and um, travel and connect with our um, sales associates that were you know in Canada and in Europe. And you know, get their requirements and implement in the system. So that was that was fun, um, and I did that for about a year and a half. And then, of course, as with all tech companies, the majority of my cha- my career changes or switches occur because of a, a reallocation or a reorg, right? So reorg, my that position goes away. I'm super sad now. I'm thinking, what am I going to do? Um, I tried really hard to get other business analyst roles in the organization, but they were going more towards senior staff. Um, and so I had, you know, check the box on testing, check the box on basic development, check the box on BA. I'm thinking what's left. And uh, an HR recruiter uh, did some kind of skills assessment and out popped the fact that I would be a good project manager. And I thought, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> and and I was told, I was lied to, by the way, I was told that all you have to do as a project manager is go to the developers and ask them how long their tasks are going to take and put those tasks in a pretty little format called Microsoft Project and then just go weekly and ask them you know, their progress and then just track their progress each week. And it's then not what pro- the narrator over voice voiceover on this is yeah spoiler alert that is not what project managers do not even in the least right so I said sure why not right you know why not sign me up and the 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 tickler the the um the the uh carrot in this situation was I was going to be going to a group that was led by a lady named Judy and Judy was known in the organization for um female empowerment, having an all-female team, which she did. I joined an all-female team, first time ever, and um, and grooming and growing female leaders. That's what she was known for. Well, I got to be under Julie's tutelage for all of two months before she decided to retire. And I was there left on my own. Um, My project management mentor, and I'll do air quotes on that, um, her mentoring was her picking up the PMBOK and slamming it on my desk and say, there you go, read that. And yeah, and the PMBOK, for those who don't know, is the Project Management Book of Knowledge. It is about 720,000 pages that if, if you need any help falling asleep, 
just put your head right down on it. You'll, you'll be yeah. done. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So I, I tried, I tried your, like what you said, Amy, I tried to, to get through, right. Reading all those inputs and outputs and processes and following the boxes. So what I would have done, I would have had flashcards. I, yeah. I mm, you know, for about a whole week and then said, I, this isn't working. So right before I was about to give up, um, an angel, <laughs> um, uh, an ally, an active ally uh, reached out to me and he saw I was struggling and, and he was a, a, a pretty senior PM. Uh, he was an IT manager at the time. And he said, um, hey, do you need help? And I said, well, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I just need to know how to do a couple of things. And he said, no problem. And he took the time very iteratively, right? It wasn't drinking from the fire hose. He would, he would literally spend very much like those tutors back in college. He would, he would spend, you know, maybe 30 minutes over lunch or in between meetings, or I would, or he would stay late. And this guy, Scott, you know, married with four kids. He would stay a few, a few minutes late and, and help me learn the tool and learn the processes and what questions to ask and really taught me, um, uh, the the essence, the spirit of what a project manager um, does for a project team. And, um, and so thank you, Bradley out there. Um, he, uh, he was, he was my first, I would say, active ally that I remember um, reaching out and helping. And, and so I followed, followed his tutelage um, all the way through and um, became a senior project manager and then I, I switched supervisors and I got Joanne. And again, now, now Joanne is the Judy, right? She's, she's the, the super boss female lead that takes no prisoners, but has a mama spirit to her as well. And she saw something in me. That's all I can say. Cause I was just, I, looking back, I felt like I was just a run in the mill PM. I was just checking the box, right? No heart in it at all and actively thinking of how do I get out of here? What's my next move? And she saw something in me and said, you know what? You should go get your PMP, your project management um, certification and I'll help you do it. And she did. She got the, she fought for me for the funding. She got me set up with, um, with mentors. Um, she got me connected to the, uh, the local uh, PMI group where they did a study session. And, um, and, sh and once I got that, that certification, I, I had the confidence now, right? I could stand up to those developers and I could- um, Get a little swagger in that status report now. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I could push back and I, I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm doing. And, and she's the one that tapped me on the shoulder and said, Angel, I, I have um, nominated you to, to learn Agile and I want you to be a scrum master. To, to one of the teams that we're launching next year. And I remember I looked over my shoulder and said, no, Joanne, I, I don't think that's a good idea. That's not what I wanna do. She said, no, I think it'll be good. It was one of those voluntold opportunities, right? And I, I went in begrudgingly and came out a, a newfound person, right? I had a new mindset, an agile mindset. And that agile uh, mindset, that framework has, propelled me into where I'm at right now, right? So did the scrum master, the product owner roles, then I went to training and teaching and loved it. And that's actually where I found my true calling, which is in training and teaching. And so I would train and teach others on project management methodologies and how I would play around with scrum and Kanban and the, the different methods to, um, to make a team more productive and successful. And, um, and that's where I learned, you know, professional speaking and again, had, had mentors and sponsors along the way that, that just helped me um, to, to, again, where I'm at now, which is leading a global team of agile coaches and having a pretty fun time doing it. That is amazing that, you know, just those little, like you can go back right in time, you can look back and you can see all these little pinpoints, all these little turning points along the way when you're living it it's not so clear where you're headed not at all right and you don't understand how these pieces are going to fit together but no. then when you get to this place where you're like oh this is what I've been preparing for yeah 
but yeah. it's really hard to see that on the front end. So for the Absolutely. people who are still like, you know, well, I'm just kind of doing what my manager tells me. I'm kind of, you know, if they send me to a training, I'll go. If they, you know, whatever it is that somebody says, you know, I think this might be good for you. Just know that this is one of the lily pads, the one of the stops along the way to wherever it is you're headed. Yeah. And, and just saying yes to those kinds of opportunities can be huge. So talk to me about this global team you're leading. What is it that, that your team does? What is it that, that the organization does? What do they deliver? Yeah. Um, so Genesis is a um, um, contact center solution, and but we're in the cloud. <laughs> so um, we pivoted from being um, on-prem into the cloud. And, and contact center, you're talking about like call centers, like customer service picks up the phone, or outbound telemarketing. Do you do that as well? We do it all. Okay. <laughs> do all right. All. I just want to make sure. Cause when sometimes when people say contact center, it's like, okay, does that mean like a, a customer relationship management tool or is it really like managing sort of this, this operation of inbound managing, and outbound calling? Yeah. Managing the call agents inbound, outbound, uh, inbound, outbound chat bots, right? The different technology, AI, learning what the different tools are. So I, I think it, um, COVID, right, 19 was a perfect example where hospital systems and various organizations had to pivot and they had massive call volume that they had not experienced before. So to have a little bot up to answer basic questions, right, that that everyone is asking, you know, where can is I this, get it? I have a cough. Is this COVID? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Or, or is there a testing site near me? You know, all of that stuff. Um, so we were able to support our customers who needed to answer those questions up front. And so my team, um, it, it's a small little team, right, of, of six coaches and two directors, um, but we support our our um, our staff globally. So our consultants, right? So our our consultants are the ones that are, that are in the background configuring um, the particular um, agent. Maybe you know what you know when you do the call trees, right? Press one for for this, press two for that, right? We we can configure all of that for our customers, and and so our um, consultants show up, and they we want to show up and add value quickly. Right. And so that's where the agile mindset and the agile methodologies and that it, those frameworks come into play where we can um, teach and train our staff and, and our teams that are that are doing this consulting and configuration work for our customers, how to show up and add value as quickly as possible. Right. The right questions to ask here, follow this process so that we can get somebody up and running in a matter of hours, right? I mean, we had we had it streamlined during COVID to where someone, a, a, a small customer could be up in 48 to 72 hours. That's incredible yeah. because technology implementations, for those who aren't familiar with it, can take months, months, months. easily yeah. can take yeah. months. And, you know, and what you're talking about is, you know, basically infusing some artificial intelligence, a whole lot of if then statements, right? Um, you know, a clear understanding of what your business is, how it operates, what are the, you know, what are the most common interactions you're going to have at this phase exactly. of the business or the interaction? Uh, what are the common questions, right? Really getting down into that, like yeah. really understanding somebody's business and being able to turn that around in just a couple of days. Yeah. That is, that is phenomenal. Yeah. Yep. So who's and, your target client? You mentioned, oh, you know, hospitals, healthcare centers. Yeah. Um, who else do you guys, you know, if you could have like your dream client land on your door tomorrow, who would that be? <laughs> we, we, we have, we have um, absolutely had, we partner with really large um, systems and, and businesses and organizations. Um, and I would say if for and I won't speak for the whole company, but I know I know for the folks that I work with and for me personally, um, if we could make inroads with our government partners, that would be a sweet spot that we really want to fill. So we are we we've just you know we have some part key partnerships is is the 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 name of the game here, um, and and we have some key strategic partners that we're working with to make inroads in that space. So I think that's like kind of ooh, right because everybody 
who, you know, calls a government line or, you know, I, I know I personally have had some tax questions lately this year and, you know, got caught up in that phone tree and got, well, let's just say frustrated. <laughs> so, so I'm thinking to myself, man, if we could just get a hold of that IRS and just whip that in the shape, that would be awesome. So that, yeah, that, that would be, again, from a personal standpoint, that would be my druthers. But no, we have some amazing clients and some, some big names um, that, that we are supporting in the back end, either directly or through partnerships. Um, so we, we are learning a lot every day because we do, we have those small mom and pop organizations. I, I met a gentleman, a manager who joined our team about a year and a half ago. And he joined our company because his, which I thought was phenomenal, his mom and dad worked at a small local doctor's office. And the doctor's office grew um, uh, to the point where they needed to have, you know, a couple of agents and they, they wanted to have um, to be able to, you know, have their patients have their health questions answered um, off hours. And so his mom being a, um, a what was she like, a, um, I guess, a, the, the desk, the to help the support uh, person, the admin, um, she got the idea to say, well, hey, if I can contract with some people to run this thing kind of 24 and answer phones, and that's what she did. And her and her husband created a whole business model like that. And they did that for years. That's fantastic. And so he, he grew up as their son being a part of that, that, that business model and knowing how to manage call center agents, how to train them, the whole, and I just thought that was awesome. And again, that's a, a small, just one, you know, one doctor having, having that need. And, um, and so they, have, they eventually grew their organization to the point where they were able to sell it. And then he, he joined the company and, and brought his knowledge uh, with them. So again, we help small companies like that all the way to, to large, what we call logos, <laughs> large, large companies. Very cool. I want to switch gears, Angel, because there are a couple things that I wanted to be sure to ask you about in this interview. Okay. And the first is, um, I want to, I'm going to get to your book. This is kind of leading to the questions about your okay. book. Okay. But you and I had a conversation a while back about what it's like to be a woman at the top. And you had told me a story about a woman that you worked for, that you were, um, I don't want to mischaracterize, but, but my recollection of this conversation is that you were a little frustrated um, by where her advocacy stopped. Mm -hmm. And you were telling me about the perspective that you now have on that. And I was wondering if you could share that story with our listeners, because, um, I think it's so important as people think about where they want to go in their careers and maybe they're frustrated that they're not getting all the support that they need, or they're not getting all of the advocacy that they need in their organizations. Um, I, I just think that story is so instructive. Yeah. Um, yeah. When I, I, I joined the organization because of her advocacy, right. She was known for and particularly um, reached out to women and persons of color uh, NIT to, to bring them in and, and build them up as leaders. And she was actively doing that. And I was one of her many, many examples that she had done over the years. And she had the most diverse team, hands down, in the entire organization. And when it got time for me to go to that, that executive level step, I needed her sponsorship. And I had it, but I... I personally was wondering why she wasn't pushing a little bit harder to those that were above her, right? That, that could kind of solidify my stamp into, into a promotion of that, that next executive level. And um, it, it, it frustrated me. Uh, it really did. And I never had the opportunity to have the conversation with her about what her thoughts were or why it felt like she was, you know, hesitant. Um, or why, why you know, I, I was able to get to a certain point, kind of the mid-manager level point, but couldn't push through to that next level. And 
it was only after I left the organization and looking back at hindsight that I can now say she didn't have the level of political and social capital in the organization to push any harder than what she already did. It, it became very clear after the fact. Um, and so that, that was eye-opening to me as I look at, at other leaders, because I, I remember being that analyst or that associate and looking up and seeing the handful of females or persons of color that had the top spot, right? This the C spot or some senior executive level spot. And you're thinking, well, why aren't they doing more? Why don't they have a, a whole team of African-American people or a whole team of Hispanic people or a whole team of women? What's going on here? And now, <laughs> now I get it, right? Now it's like, you're constantly on a daily basis negotiating when to push, when not to. And you yourself are constantly um, assessing, right? When, when's the right time to um, advocate for a candidate versus when you may want to throttle back. Um, and now that I realize the pressure of that double bind of you wanting to reach down and pull others up, but you having to be very careful about um, the perception because you, you have to manage your own perception and you have to keep your seat secure. Otherwise you can't help anybody else or advocate for anybody else. Um, so there's, there's all these internal conversations that you have with yourself. Um, some quite frankly are, might not be true, some, some might be. <laughs> um, and, and then you're managing other people's perception of you and, and you're being very mindful about who it is that you kind of cherry pick and bring up. And even though you think somebody is phenomenal, I, and I had it myself, right? I'm a mid, mid manager level. I see a, a senior program, I, I see a program manager and I wanna bring her up I actually, there were two females I wanted to bring up to senior program management level. I wanted them to get that, that bonus. I wanted them to get the title and I want them to get that raise. And it was a true wall up, right? No matter what they did, no matter how great they were, no matter how many huge, complex, crazy projects that they completely just smashed, right? Like you guys rocked that. You killed it. You had six different crazy stakeholders all asking for six different deadlines and things. And you managed all that flawlessly and managed to bring the project in with, you know, within a certain amount of time and within a certain amount of budget. In, in my mind, if that had been quite frankly, a Caucasian American male who had knocked it out of the park the way they did, that would have been a slam dunk for a promotion. But these ladies were told, well, let, let's see, let's make sure that you can consistently perform. And, you know, I, you know that, the, that situation, that experience um, taught me so much. But what it did was it strengthened my resolve to make sure that I continue to advocate and challenge and not back down, but also at the same time to know that that's a personal sacrifice that you might be making. It, you know, you, you might be falling on the sword and it be detrimental to your career. You could get ostracized, you could get demoted, you could be blacklisted. Right. I mean, there are there are very tangible consequences, negative consequences to someone who is the only at that level. And if you choose not to make that sacrifice because you're, you're trying to protect your own career. Who am I to judge? Who is anybody to judge? You don't know until you walk a half a mile in those, in those shoes. Right. Um, so, again, now that now that I'm in the rare air. And I look at my peers and, and what they're doing and how they're moving and how they're trying to advocate. It is, it is in a subtle way, but it is happening. And sometimes when you're at, again, at that associate or mid-level manager level, you don't, you don't see it. 
Yeah, I think the the level of risk um, is directly to proportion is directly proportionate to the amount of intersectionality you yourself are experiencing. Exactly. And so, even though you want to be the person who kicks down the door and lets everybody come in behind you, Absolutely. it's more like a turnstile, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you have to be really careful how you usher someone through it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. then, you know, if you look at your peers who are not black, who are not women, um, you know, who have probably been in their seats a little bit longer, right? It would take so little for them to risk. Just let somebody jump the queue, right? Just bring somebody else over with you. And I, I found that that conversation that we had, you know, it was, it's so real, right? Because everybody I know who is in some sort of underrepresented group, right? They don't see themselves in the C-suite or they have the one that they see is frustrated because why aren't there more of us? Why aren't, you know, why isn't that person and all the responsibility falls on that one person, And, you know, my takeaway from, from our conversation and so many others that I've had with people is it's not on that person. It's on everybody around them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And, and that's needed. That is that, that's a hard conversation to have, especially when you're dealing with the dynamic of Caucasian American females to minority females. That, that is something that we don't discuss because quite transparently, I'll speak for me and the, and the other women that I've interviewed, um, we feel left behind. We feel that the, the glass ceiling is starting to break a little bit for white women getting into those senior level C levels, um, positions, you know, you're at, you're at a whopping 7% of CEOs of fortune 500 companies, woohoo. But guess what? I can count two right now, two right. African-American females that are CEO. And I, I think one's coming up this month, right? Um, wait, I know we have, I know we have Rosalind for, for, she went from Starbucks to Walgreens. And I think there's a, there's a second lady coming behind her and that's it. So I, so I got right. two, you guys have at least 7%, right? You're in, <laughs> you're, you're at like 30, 33, right? Yeah. Not great numbers for anybody by any stretch of the imagination, but man, you made it to double digits, right? In terms right. of, in terms of numbers of, of females in the C-suite. Um, so again, it's starting to break a little bit, but for us, it's, it's a concrete ceiling. Absolutely. So that just means we have to have different tools and different um, advice that has to be, no pun intended, colored for us, right? And, and, and I, and I've asked coaches that, um, I, I've been fortunate enough to interview um, several well-renowned, you know, TEDx level um, speaking individuals, folks with books that have their own practice that specifically uh, dedicate their practice to um, to a, a all-female clientele in that are that are that are moving up in the business world. And I ask them, do you give different advice? to your Caucasian clients than you do minority clients. And they said, all of them resoundingly said, at first, no, we didn't. But now that we've grown as coaches and as experts, we now see the difference. And yes, we do have to give different advice and and to tailor it um, to particularly to that individual's culture, their company culture. And there is a much thinner tightrope, they call it the tightrope that minority women have to um, have to walk, that um, it's, it's just every time you layer on that level degree of separation, you're, you're adding, you're adding the, the rope gets a little thinner. Right. So, you know, so I think a lot of diversity programs, DE&I programs in the past, um, we saw white women benefit from those programs because when men look around and say, okay, okay, guys, we got to open it up a little bit here. We got, we got to look for some diversity. The first they go to are, are women because it's only just one degree of separation. It's just gender. They don't have to learn or cross the divide or learn a different language or, 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 or anything different because um, the race is the same and the culture is the same. 
But when you start laying or laying on <laughs> those different layers, it it those degrees of separation can feel like a chasm to get across. And it is so hard. And, and we're seeing that, right, playing out in the numbers. You guys you know, don't have to believe me. You just, you know, do a quick Google search and you'll see that um, there are considerably more white females um, getting those top C-suite positions at this point. And so now we have to think, okay, let's, let's focus on what are the specific um, skills that are needed for women of color. And here's an interesting thing too. I attended um, an eMERGE program through um, the IT Senior uh, Management Forum. And eMERGE came about after they did just a regular uh, senior management forum for IT, African-American IT execs. So for a couple of years, they just ran a forum for both men and women who were you know, learning to navigate and get up to the, the upper levels of corporate America. And even African-American coaches and leaders and trainers realized, oh, wait, there's some different, some different techniques we have to give our African-American female emerging leaders. And hence, Emerge came along because it's a dedicated group of even, even the microcosm within the African-American community. We have to focus on the African-American women. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. People always ask me, well, okay, so we have some women in our C-suite. Why isn't that enough? Like, clearly we're doing something right. And, it, you know, my question is always, okay, did your org chart pass the squint, the squint test? Which is if I squint really hard and I can't read everybody's titles, can I pick out who's who, right? Because it's usually the white woman's in charge of HR and the black woman's in charge of D&I and white men have every other seat. Um, so most organizations, right, at the top levels, at least, you know, you can't pass the squint test of the org chart. Um, but then, you know, it's also, you know, what works for white women doesn't work for anybody else. And white women cannot be the barometer of success for your diversity and inclusion efforts, because what you've done is you've created a pinhole for people to pass through and not a gate. Uh, uh excellent analogy that is a great visual yeah absolutely absolutely so angel tell us about your book that's coming out dense in the ceiling you've mentioned you know the glass ceiling and, and the uh the concrete ceiling as you call it what do you hope to do with your book oh gosh okay um threefold really um so one it's to give voice we have been silent for far too long about our experiences in corporate america um, I had examples that had happened to me with supervisors and colleagues that quite honestly, I forgot that they happened until I took the time to sit back and breathe and start journaling um, my experiences. And that is so many of the women that I talked to. I can't tell you how many people said, oh my gosh, I forgot that that happened. Or I never told anybody this, but right? That was like in almost every interview. I've never told anybody about this that happened to me, but, and, you know, for various reasons, um, but most of it is because um, we're twofold. One, we're taught to be silent. I, I know I was, I know by my grandmother, it was put your head down, suck it up and keep going. Right. Um, which is a, a great, um, thing to do when you're in crisis mode. <laughs> you, you have to. Um, and for quite some time, African-American women in this country have been in crisis mode. So that- Probably about 401 years of it. Right, yeah. So that advice makes sense. But now we're at the point where we can do a little bit of self-healing and, and, and come, come out of that and, and do, some, do some work to unpack um, the trauma that we've experienced. Um, and then secondly, you know, it, just out of fear. I personally- have seen a senior level African-American um, VP of IT walked out the door. She did nothing wrong. Oh, well, maybe other than step on the toes of her new boss, <laughs> right? Um, so, so that left it, that leaves a, an indelible mark and, and a, a very clear message, right? Nobody has to say anything anymore, tread lightly, walk lightly, right? Um, so we've seen it. We've heard the stories, we've seen it. Um, 
so, so one is to give our African-American women like me who are um, mid or senior level in their career, um, a chance to read about other women who they probably very have very shared experiences with. The second um, focus is to create active allies. I wanna make folks aware that this is happening because we don't talk about it, they're not gonna know, <laughs> you know? So, um, so let's put the stories out there. So, so folks that want to um, help can, they, they know what they're dealing with, right? And then third, my favorite group, the emerging leaders, right? Those, those females who are maybe three to five years out of college, you know, hey, here, here's what might happen. Here's what could happen. If it does, you're not the only one. And here's some practical tips of how to get through that situation if it does happen to you. Um, and, and, and to give them courage, right? To keep going and to fight and, you know, stay in that CS major. Don't let that professor who said you don't belong here, don't listen to that professor. We were all told that. We all got that message at one point. Don't let that stop you, right? So um, to give hope, to, to it's my way of virtually passing the baton to the next generation of um, IT leaders in tech. Angel, I want to thank you so much for your time today. I want to thank you for not only validating um, out in the open, right, the experiences of other women, um, you know, to, to borrow Oprah's question, right, were you silent or were you silenced? Um, but also carrying that message to people who need to hear it, who can help affect change, and also giving hope and inspiration to the next generation. Thank you so much. Um, Dense in the Ceiling is available June 8th. I'm assuming people can get that on Amazon. Yes, we're on yes. Amazon now. All right, very good. Well, thank you so much. And um, hopefully uh, in, a, you know, in a few months, you can come back and you can tell us how the book went and how the launch is going and uh, all the opportunities that you're creating out there in the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Living Corporate is brought to you by The Break Room. Have you ever felt burnt out, depressed, or otherwise exhausted by being one of the onlys at work? You know what I'm talking about. Hosted by Black psychologists, psychiatrists, and PhDs, The Break Room is a live weekly web show in the Living Corporate Network that discusses mental health, wellness, and healing for black folks at work. Name another weekly show explicitly focused on mental health, wellness, and healing for black folks at work. I'll wait. This is why you got to check out The Break Room airing every Thursday at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time on livingcorporate.tv. Was an angel fun. What I love about this interview is, you know, the way that she explains the technology, but also her experience growing up um, in and around technology in her career and kind of the nuance that she puts on the different roles and responsibilities and impacts of, you know, technology, you know, in business and in the world. So if you enjoyed this episode, even half as much as I did, don't forget to subscribe to Living Corporate and share us with your friends and colleagues. And hey, you can really help us out by leaving us a six star review wherever you get your podcasts. You may be thinking, but there are only five stars. How can I give you six? Well, give us all those stars and then go the next step by leaving just a couple of sentences in your own words, telling us what you liked about the show, the conversation, or the guest. Don't forget to visit living-corporate.com to learn more about our other podcasts, videos, web shows, and more. See It To Be It is brought to you in part by Lead At Any Level, a certified woman and LGBT-owned business dedicated to to helping organizations turn their reclusive nerds into inclusive leaders. Lead at any level. Leaders can be anywhere and should be everywhere. Learn more at leadatanylevel.com. That's it for this episode of See It to Be It. This is Amy C. Wanninger, and I'll see you next week. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com.
You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.